So I would just get started and I'm really excited. Again, thank you so much for the warm introduction and kind invitation for us to come here to share a little bit about how we have been thinking about testing data-driven practice, but in particularly for clustering in, for instance, single cell data analysis, which a lot of folks do fantastic work here. In particular, before I start talking about the actual methodology, in the spirit of a primer, I actually wanna take us through in terms of how data analysis practice has really evolved in the past decade or so for biomedical data specifically. So on the left, what I'm showing you here is a very classic picture of how we learned to do data analysis when we were in, for instance, our first um, um, uh, uh, stats, I guess, class in undergrad, where the first step is to first come up with a hypothesis from an interesting scientific question, and then equipped with the hypothesis, we're gonna go out, design some experiments, do some data collection, and of course, after we have our data, in order to make sense of the data, we then need to run things like modeling and do scientific inference as on top of our data that we have already collected. So of course, this paradigm is extremely popular because we know a lot about the theoretical guarantees of our procedure in terms of, for instance, when are they gonna be valid? We can also imagine that because we have to pre-specify a hypothesis before we can collect and look at our data, we also lose a lot of the interesting insights in our data because we have to pre-specify our hypothesis. With the advances of more than about biotechnology like single cell RNA sequencing, we know that there are a lot of interesting insights that we don't a priori can specify. For instance, we're increasingly seeing this paradigm I'm showing on the right where oftentimes, if you talk to a computational biologist, the first thing you're gonna do with their collaborator is actually just to collect a lot of the data by sequencing, for instance, your whole participant pool, because you know there's something interesting lying underlying your data. You, don't, you just don't quite know exactly what your hypothesis is gonna be at this moment. So with things like exploratory data analysis and clustering, you're then gonna come up with something interesting based on your data set like, for instance, whether these two clusters like respond to different um, subtypes of patients. And then you're going to, of course, still want to do some set of modeling and inference as a result, because that's how you can validate the scientific hypothesis you came up with in the second step. So you can imagine that in contrast to the paradigm on the left, the right paradigm is extremely rich because you can now look at your data before coming up with a scientific question but on the contrary, there's relatively little known about the properties of these procedures because the classical tests do not allow for looking at your data first before coming up with these scientific questions. So really today's talk are gonna center on how can we bring in a little bit more statistical guarantee that we have and love from the left to the modern paradigm that we practice on the right. And to open with this, I wanna motivate with, um, and these are the three papers, we'll be talking about today in my talk, looking at, in particular, this technique called um, selective inference what applied to different set of, of clustering algorithm. And before I dive into the actual detailed math, I wanna walk us through a featured application of how this very abstract data analysis pipeline I talked about is gonna contextualize for something like single cell RNA sequencing analysis. And on the picture I'm showing you here, I'm basically showing you a very simple example of how people think about these analysis in modern paradigm of, in this case, analyzing the cell type heterogeneity in human liver tissue. So as many of us sitting here and on Zoom know, single cell RNA sequencing really changed or revolutionized the field of biology because for the first time, we're able to understand the cell type information on a single cell level. And in the case over here, the researchers took a small section of the human liver tissue they isolate and purify the cells, and then they put them through this tiny machine I'm showing here using a, a cartoon of the sequencer. And as a result, to a data scientist, you can abstract the sequencing output as this matrix, where essentially each row of this matrix is gonna be a cell, and each column of this matrix is gonna be a gene. And correspondingly, each cell of this matrix over here is gonna be the measured abundance for a gene, in a particular cell. So of course, in practice, the matrix that we actually have in, at our hand are gonna be much larger, right? Because we can measure, for instance, 
thousands of cells in one single experiment, and we can probably reliably measure, say, 20,000 genes for a human experiment. And of course, with this very complex high dimensional matrix, people often resort to these exploratory analysis I talked about before. In particular, you might be familiar with these plots a lot in the papers you see, where the researchers often do here is that they will first cluster the observations they have. So in particular, in this case, I'm visualizing my output using a two-dimensional plot where each point is going to be a cell. So each point here is going to be correspond to a row in my input matrix. And the colors of the points are going to be, in this particular case, colored using the estimated k-means clustering membership in the original gene feature space. In this case, you can see a lot of interesting patterns coming up because there are different points that are they're corresponding to different estimated cluster membership. In particular, there are a set of interesting questions people often ask when they are at this step of the analysis. So for instance, if you stare at this plot for a little bit, one question you might be interested in asking is that these two clusters, 11 and 14, which I'm coloring in yellow and red, they look pretty close to each other, but they're also estimated to be different clusters. So one canonical question people ask is that across all the genes that I've able to measure, whether there's a difference between these two estimated clusters. And in a biological context, this can, um, like for instance, essentially like corresponding to whether these two are underlying subtypes of the cell that you might discover in your underlying experiment. And on top of that, whether these two like clusters are truly different or not, another set of questions people are also interested in is to say that if I know, like for instance, these two cells are two different subtypes, which are the subs of the genes I can measure that explains the difference. So in a biological context, these correspond to something like a cell marker gene selection, where essentially in this case, you're not only interested in understanding the different compositions or types of the cells you have, you're also trying to elucidate which are the subset of the genes I can use to further validate the existence of these cells in the future experiment or in the other data sets that people have collected. So equipped with these two questions, can imagine that if you zoom out and squint your eyes a little bit, these do seem to like a very classical hypothesis testing questions, right? Essentially, you're trying to understand, for instance, whether there's a true difference in means between two different groups. So when we were approached by these questions by our collaborators in computational biology, the first thing we do is try to understand essentially what are the current practice that people are using in their very efficient and convenient um, uh, like computational pipeline. And it turns out that in this case, when we're looking at this problem, the current analysis mostly treat these as a pretty simple problem. And the approach they're gonna take is a pretty quote unquote naive approach where they basically say that this is just a simple test for a difference in means because I have these two different groups defined by, by my two different cluster groups. And then I'm just gonna pretend that I can use like a t-test or a um, well Coxon rank sum test without accounting for the fact that these two groups they're actually defined by my data or driven by my data as well. And uh, just to drive the point home a little bit, if you do single cell analysis, you know what SIRET is. If you don't do it, it's a package that's extremely popular. You can see that when I pulled the number um, a couple of weeks ago, the package, the like corresponding paper that's like published in 2019 has been cited almost 10,000 times. And in particular, if you go into one of the functions that they use to compute these marker gene selection, you're going to see that they have this pretty hidden disclaimer that I'm highlighting in red here, which is buried in their functional description by saying that the p-values coming out of this pipeline should be interpreted cautiously because the set of the genes that you're using for doing these kind of difference in means tests is the same set of the genes they're using for clustering. So of course, this is unsatisfactory to some extent because I don't exactly know what I should do with this cautious notation in my actual data analysis, right? So when we look at this and found this addition, um, like cautionary tell, the questions we're going to ask is, despite the simplicity and the popularity of this approach, whether this very simple approach for these two problems that we encounter so much in computational biology for single cell analysis 
is valid from a statistical point of view. And to understand this a little bit better, I'm actually going to take a step back and zoom out and try to actually analyze this in a setting of a simulation where I know exactly what's happening. And to motivate the problem of the current approach, I'm going to first just sample 100 observations showing on the left panel over here, where I've sampled the points from the same distribution. So you can see that they're all coming from the same big gray blob, and there's really no clustering going on because all of them are coming from the same distribution with same mean and same variance. And after that, I'm going to pretend I'm doing this analysis of understanding different cell subtypes. I'm going to apply k-means clustering to like cluster my cell into um, a blue cluster and a red cluster. And then in step number three, I'm going to mimic what I do in differential testing in current process by basically compute a p-value for a difference in means between these two estimated clusters. And in this particular case, before I show you what the p-values I'm going to get, from the bottom of my heart, I want my p-values to be pretty large, right? Because no matter what your cutoff is, in this particular case, I know that because I sampled all the observations from the same distribution, I would intuitively want little evidence to reject my null hypothesis because I know there's really not, nothing intrinsically different about the red cluster and the blue cluster. And when you say the same distribution, would that be a Gaussian distribution? Is that yeah, that's a really good question. I'm going to get into the distribution assumption of our procedure later. In this particular case, I did draw them from a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution to um, illustrate the phenomena, but the same results are going to apply to other distribution as well. Uh, but great question. Um, and in step number three, of course, um, I've told you that we intuitively want a small, um, a large p-value. But if you actually compute it, you're going to get the p-value is tiny. Um, and this is not great because you know that this means that if I were actually doing a real data analysis, I would then take this p-value and conclude that there's a lot of evidence for two new different subtypes I've discovered in my data. And just to drive the point home a little bit. Can I just add something? To yeah, that? of course. That's not, I don't totally agree with that because like a, a similar example to this, like a real example would be like, if I did my single cell experiment and then just took one cell type like these cells and I just divided them randomly in two, I would also find differences, but they're probably like driven by something technical. So there's like technical noise in single cell data, which we think on a per cluster level might lead to some of the spread, but there's also some biological differences. So, so just because you get differential expression signal when we do our stuff, it doesn't mean we immediately think it's real. Um, because there's also the technical aspect. So um, I don't think this is like, like if I did this on my B cells and I saw that, I would not be concerned, I guess is my point. Yeah, it's a really good question. I think if I were to paraphrase your point, it's essentially that just because these two subsets are truly different, according to the test, it doesn't have to be biological, right? There's a lot of things like uh, batch effects that could have um, sort of affected the interpretation of the result. But I guess my point is that what I'm showing here is that there's really no difference due to either biological or technical, and you're seeing a very small p-value. So that's a real point I'm driving here. But I totally agree that in an actual comprehensive, in a in an actual real data analysis, there's a lot more pre-processing and also post-processing steps to make sure the scientific conclusion is valid. Um, great. Um, so sort of coming back to where I left off. Um, the curious point here is that a lot of you may already intuitively know that there's something wrong with this procedure because we're using the data twice, both for clustering and for testing. Um, and maybe something that you are thinking you ahead could have solved this problem is something like sample split. But as I, as I will show you in the next couple of slides, it turns out that something that we uh, love and is really close to our heart, like sample split, which really gets us out of a lot of problems, like doing the train test, uh, validation is actually not going to work here. And just to drive the point of that particular last point a little bit more, let's imagine how we could have done a sample split in this particular case doing clustering. So you can imagine that again, for instance, if I have a bunch of observations here, the first step of doing a sample split is very intuitively to divide your observation into a training set and testing set. So in this particular case, I've conveniently labeled my points as they will fall into either training set or test set. 
But again, all I did is just to sample 100 observations from the same distribution. So again, this should be the case where there's really no clustering going on. And I'm expecting, in a good case, a large p-value. And if you split your data into a training and testing set, again, they look like they're from the same distribution because I'm just dividing the observations randomly. And in sample number two, because we're trying to make sure that we're only using the training data for clustering, it's probably not too surprising that I'm trying to cluster my training data set, in this case, into, again, two clusters in orange and green. And in step number three, now that I have my training labels on my training set, a very natural thing to do is to find a way to transfer them into the test set. You can do various different things to it, but I'm going to do one particular thing which really generalizes to whatever classification thing you're going to try to come up with, is to say that a pretty intuitive way for labeling my test observation is to basically pick out which training centroid they're closer to. In this particular case, we use a, um, a nearest neighbor-like classifier uh, rule to label our test observations. And if in this particular case, I've got a orange cluster and a, and a green cluster in my test set as well. And then you can repeat this exercise of computing the p-value on the test set. But in this case, the p-value is still going to be really tiny. And intuitively, this is also going to be the case because when you're trying to infer the labels of the observation in the test set, you implicitly already use the information because you're trying to assign the labels based on the observation's distance to the training centroid. So this is very interesting. And I agree with intuition. And you show an example. And I agree with that. But maybe this works in some other, I mean, uh, uh, this is just an example, right? Uh, how we know that in, in certain cases this might work actually versus it's a general thing that won't work. Yeah, it's a really good question. So I think the question, if I were to paraphrase a little bit, is that uh, I'm showing you some simulations and some real data, um, some data examples later too, um, but it's not exhaustive, right? Like how can you make sure that this doesn't work for some cases? I think the advantage of our method, as you'll see later, is that we can actually mathematically prove that our procedure actually works versus, I guess, the common practice. I imagine you're going to get similar results in some data analysis examples, as I will show you later, at least in a qualitative sense. But I think it's much better to have a procedure that uh, not only controls the false discovery, but also has the power to reject the null hypothesis when they do not hold. Just maybe hold on that for an another 20 minutes when I get to my real data analysis example. Great. Um, so I've showed you and a lot of intuitive examples why this procedure doesn't work. And I'm talking to a group of really talented folks here um, just to drive the point home a little bit, maybe anchoring on this question before as well. If you repeat this one toy example like a thousand times, you're going to get the type one error inflation is really huge, right? With 5% nominal rate, we would expect that we only reject the null hypothesis 5% of the time, but in practice or in simulation, we actually reject it 97% of the time. So really a huge inflation in the amount of quote unquote discoveries we're gonna make. And this group of audience is no far into this kind of idea and doing science really rigorously quantitatively. So we already have the intuition that the problem really occurs because you're using the data twice and to phrase it a little bit more precisely, because the null hypothesis we're testing here is data driven because they're a function of the cluster we estimate on the data, the test statistic we love and know are not gonna follow their usual null distribution anymore. So for instance, if you remember how back in the days so you're trying to look up a p-value from a Z table or the CDF using R or Python, it's basically to say that the CDF function you're referring is wrong because now the distribution is gonna, not gonna be the one that you were referring to. In particular, just to drive the point really home, because the null distribution that you're referring is wrong, the resulting p-values are not going to be distributed as uniform 0, 1 under the null hypothesis, which really is the pillar of controlling any type of any, any type of um, type one error rate control. Now, uh, given that we really have a problem with this naive approach, I'm actually going to take us through a little bit about the problem setup. So do bear with me for a couple slides of math, uh, where we're going to try to set up the problems we're trying to tackle for the rest of the talk. So we're going to consider our samples coming from multivariate normal distributions with potentially unknown means. And I'm going to assume for the second that my variance is you know, a, multi a multiple of the diagonal and it's known. 
but this can be easily generated to the unknown cases if you have a decent estimator of the variance of your data. I'm going to then apply clustering to obtain cluster C1 hat and C2 hat. For the context of our talk, the clustering algorithms are roughly going to be referring to k-means clustering, but we'll also have a slide of how this extends to something like hierarchical clustering at the end as well. And in this particular case, I also want to point out that while I'm showing you the example with two different clusters, our method, as you'll see later, naturally generalizes to multiple clusters, as long as you're testing one pair at a time. And uh, I'm going to then present you something that's a little bit mouthful to digest. But basically, I'm going to state that the goal of our procedure is to really correct the current analysis by proposing a test for a difference in means between these two different clusters, C1 hat and C2 hat. And I want my test to control what's known as the selective type 1 error rate, which is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis, given that number one, the null hypothesis holds, and number two, that we decide to conduct this very test. And the second part of the decide to conduct this very test really speaks to the fact that we need to account for the fact that we decided to estimate these like clusters and test these pair of difference in means test in the first place. Now, equipped with this, that, um, before I dive into the actual solutions, I also want to give a one minute, again, in the spirit of primer, of how k-means clustering works. So as many of us sitting here know, k-means clustering is an extremely popular way to partition our data. And in this particular case, we are using the Lloyd's algorithm, which essentially proceeds in a very intuitive and iterative fashion to partition your data. So in the first step of the algorithm, you're just going to randomly sample two observations as your initial centroid. And given the two initial centroid, you're then going to assign the rest of the observations to just whichever centroid they're closer to. In this case, in the first step of the update, I've clustered my data into a red cluster and a blue cluster. But of course, there's no reason why my initial sample centroid is any good. So in the next step of the iteration, I'm just going to iteratively refine the centroid I have by, for instance, in this case, recomputing the empirical mean of the bool cluster and the red cluster to get to updated centroids of my clustering algorithm. And then we just proceed in this two-step fashion by reassigning the observations and recomputing the centroids, so on and so forth. It turns out that it's guaranteed to converge in this particular case for our, in actually all the data sets. And on this particular case, the algorithm took eight iterations to converge. And one piece of intuition and mental picture I want us to take away in this case is really this picture I'm showing on the top, where because of its iterative nature, Kimi's algorithm is going to assign a clustering of, of all the observations at each iteration of its algorithm, which means that I can really give a name to this mental picture on the left, which I'm going to call them CIT, where I goes from 1 through N indexes my observations, and T goes from 1 through capital T, with capital T being 8 in this case, goes through all the number of iterations in my algorithm. And this is nothing but the entire sequence of cluster assignment in k-means clustering. And with this mental picture in mind, we're now in intellectually ready to talk about what a solution is going to look like in this very particular case. Writing things down a little bit more precisely, what I meant by the naive p-value first is really I'm simply using this probability of computing what's the probability of observing a more extreme distance between the two estimated centroids than my observed data under the null hypothesis. And we already know from not only the simulation, but we can actually show mathematically that this naive test does not follow uniform 0, 1 under even the null distribution because the null hypothesis that the mean of these two estimated clusters are, are the same is a function of the data. So how do we really solve this problem, right? It turns out that, as with many other things in more than statistics, an intuitive solution is often buried in some hidden, um, hidden work, at least, I guess, philosophically, back in the 60s and 70s. And this problem is no exception. It turns out that drawing the line known as conditional inference, you can actually arrive at a conceptual solution for this problem by not only compute the probability, but actually compute the conditional probability of observing a more extreme observation, conditional on the fact 
that clustering your original data gives you this pair of estimate clusters, C1 hat and C2 hat. In particular, I'm not gonna show you the math here, but you can mathematically prove that if you can compute this p-ideal p-value I'm showing you here, this particular conditional probability is gonna not only lead to the type of narrow control that we set out to achieve in the first place, it also actually has a really nice connection to the old um, reference of conditional inference back in the 60s, which has since been adapted to the regression settings in the 2010s. So imagine if you did a lasso regression and you have some variables selected and you want to test their significance, this framework is also really very much applicable in that setting. But we're among the first to actually extend it to the setting of unsupervised learning, like clustering in the 2020s, and really necessitate a new set of technical tools, as I'll show you later, because unsupervised setting is a new territory. But in particular, if you just believe my word for a second, this very intuitive conditional p-value should really be all we need. And if that was the case, I guess my talk could have ended 20 minutes early. But if you stare at this p-value for a little bit, and if you have done any sort of like, for instance, computational intensive procedures like Bayesian analysis, you would know that just because you can write something down in statistics doesn't mean you can compute it efficiently on your real data sets. And this is very much the problem here where while we know that this conditional probability, if you were able to compute and characterize it, is gonna give us the valid procedure, it's actually very hard to compute on real data sets for a couple of reasons. And I wanna highlight two in particular. The first one is if you think about what this capital X is, it's this giant cell by gene matrix that we have in a single cell analysis I motivated my methods on. And even under the now hypothesis that the two data are the same, the, or the means of the two like, clusters are the same, there's a lot of unknown parameters of this large matrix X under the now hypothesis. And in the statistical jargon, this is known as the presence of large number of unknown nuisance parameter, which really intuitively just to say that because you don't really know parts of the distribution, it's actually really difficult to compute the p-value efficiently because now you have to compute a high dimensional integral, for instance, to compute this probability. And the second part, really central to our specific problem, is if you think about what the C1 hat and C2 hat are gonna be, they're representing the estimated clusters from k-means clustering, right? And because I showed you before that k-means clustering is such a highly iterative algorithm, characterizing how the final cluster is gonna depend on your initial input is also gonna be quite challenging because you could potentially need to enumerate over all the possible path that actually lead to the final clusters you get using k-means clustering or original data. And these two intuitions really motivated us to actually come up with a solution that simply modifies the initial conditioning part of this orange part that I'm showing in the conditional probability by saying that the solution we're gonna arrive is to simply condition on a little bit more information than that's necessary. And it turns out that you can also intuitively understand that this is gonna be okay because I still have the information that I choose to test this test because I estimate these two clusters. And you can also mathematically show that using a pretty simple argument that this also maintains the type one error rate control that we really need to solve in the first place. In particular, the p-values that we're gonna to propose to solve our problem is this p-value I'm showing as p-selective over here, where you can see that we are augmenting the conditioning set a little bit. And for the orange part, I'm simply just rewriting what clustering X results in C1 hat and C2 hat mean using the CIT notation. So if you remember, CIT is the observation that I get, you know, uh, the, the cluster assignment I have for ith observation in teeth iteration of my algorithm. But I'm also conditioning on two more things. The first thing that's a little bit easy to explain over here is that you, I'm also conditioning on the iteration from t equals one to capital T, which is to say that in addition to the final clustering, I'm also conditioning on the information on all the intermediate clusters of k-means clustering. In this particular case, the intuition here is that while it's very hard to characterize how the final clustering depends on our initial input data, because we know exactly how the iterative updates happen, it's much easier to characterize how the next iteration 
depends on the last update of k-means clustering because you have a well sought out formula for doing so. And as you conditioning on all the intermediate cluster and with this intuition that each intermediate neighboring cluster assignment can be nicely linked with each other mathematically, it turns out that with a very simple induction argument, this is gonna give you much more efficient characterization. And I'm also hiding away a bunch of linear algebra essentially using other stuff, which I'm happy to talk to you at the end of the talk or in the discussion section, if you are a big fan of linear algebra as I am, but essentially conditioning on those part is really to achieve this thing of eliminating uh, the unknown nuisance parameter under the now hypothesis, which in practice just mean that by conditioning on the right amount of other stuff, that's not really tied to like the clustering algorithm per, per se, we're gonna be able to reduce the problem as I'll show you later from a high dimensional probability computation into a one dimensional single probability computation. Now with this piece selective in mind, I wanna give us a little bit of computational insight while I cannot spell out all the details of why this leads to some computational efficiency gain in this particular case for k-means clustering. So the first thing I'm gonna tell you is that if you just imagine that the more is really right, uh, written out in a lot of detailed math, is that skipping the math I'm hiding away here, it turns out that you can rewrite this probability, which on the first line, I'm just rewriting the definition, and you can see that it depends on this random think cell by G matrix capital X. It turns out that if you condition on the right amount of stuff, you're actually gonna get a probability that only depends on a single parameter, phi over here. And this phi is gonna, it looks complicated. It's just really the right scaling version of a chi-square distribution. And it's probably not too surprising to have a chi-square pops up here. If you remember from your stats class, right? If you have multivariate um, capital X, chi-square is nothing but the L2 norm or the square scrolled version of the L2 norm of a multivariate normal distribution, which means that it's natural to have some version of it over here. And basically, because I know exactly the distribution of phi, as long as I can compute this essentially conditioning part over here, I'm essentially done because that's just gonna be one line of Python code to compute this conditional probability by calling the CDF of a chi-square distribution. And in this case, I'm also having this new notation x prime of phi, which is essentially just a linear function of phi that I will show you a little bit later what exactly it represents. It turns out that while we arrive at x prime of phi in a mathematical derivation, it also carries a very intuitive meaning to it as well. In this case, once we arrive at this one dimensional representation, I've told you that it's probably easy to see that because we have a single probability and we know exactly what phi is, it suffices to just characterize the conditioning set I'm showing in orange. And uh, if you remember what CIT is, this conditioning set is nothing but to say that what is the values of phi on the real line so that clustering this x prime of phi will give me the same sequence of k-means clustering as if I were to cluster the original data x. And this almost immediately gives us a pretty naive algorithm already because you can imagine, as I'll show you in the next slide, that if I have this characterization for the set S and the set S is all I need to compute this probability, why don't I just take a grid value of different values of phi on the real line and try to approximate my set S. Um, so to expand on that intuition a little bit, right? So I have this intuition of what the set S should be, it turns out that this x prime of phi also have a very nice visualization that we can exploit in our actual computation. So it turns out that if you use the original data with phi equals the observed distance between these two clusters, in this toy example being 3.7 here, the x prime of phi is going to be exactly the same as the original data x. And in this case, if you apply k-means clusterings on the original data, because you estimate these clusters in the first place, it's probably not surprising to us that in this case, applying k-means clustering to x prime 3.7, being the distance between two, these two different clusters is gonna give us, or it's gonna recover the original two clusters we're interested in testing, the blue one and the pink one over here. And just to give us a little bit intuition about what's gonna happen with a smaller value of phi, 
in this case, if you have B equals zero, it turns out that it's doing nothing but really pulling these two clusters closer to each other. And it turns out that zero is gonna be the empirical difference between the mean of the pink cluster and the blue cluster. And it's gonna leave the orange cluster or any other like clusters we're not testing intact. And in this case, you can also visually just see that we cannot really separate these two clusters anymore. And K-means clusterings do not lead to pink and blue clusters that we're interested in testing in the first place. And by the definition of the set S, we know that clustering X prime of zero and original data X is gonna result in different sequence of cluster, which means by, that by definition, zero is not gonna be in the set S. And the same intuition holds in the opposite direction, where if you expand your set with V equals five, what you're gonna see is that it's simply just pulling apart these pink cluster and the blue cluster, which in this case means that K-means clustering can easily tell these two clusters apart again. And if you apply the definition of the set S, you're gonna get that five is gonna be in the set S. So obviously we already have a way to approximate the original set, but it turns out that number one, if you apply this fashion overall, it's gonna be an approximation and it can be quite computationally intensive because at each iteration or each value of the set S, I have to do one copy of K-means clustering, right? So it turns out that in this particular case for K-means clustering, you can actually do something much better. So I'm gonna share with you two, comp two computational insights for how we're able to do this. But the first insight is to simply say that in this particular case, as I showed you before, the p-selective that we need to compute for our procedure can be computed pretty easily using the like, cumulative like, distribution of a chi-square distribution truncated to the set S. So the first insight is just basically summarizing what I told you in the past couple of slides. And what's really surprising is actually the second insight, which is to say that the set S can actually be characterized in OTKQ operations, while the exact operation order doesn't matter. This is actually exactly the same time you actually need to perform a k-means clustering estimation in the first place, which is to say that we only need to run one pass of the k-means algorithm estimation procedure to get our conditioning set as well as this p-selective, which is really a big boost from doing this approximation I'm showing you before. And we're able to do this, which I'm happy to talk to you at the end of the talk, if you're curious as well, by saying that the set S can be characterized as a bunch of intersection of the solutions to quadratic inequalities where the quadratic part really comes up because you're using L2 distance to do the k-means clustering and the inequality part comes up because essentially at each step of the iteration, you have to decide which centroid is this current observation closer to, which naturally translates to a bunch of um, inequality constraints of the original procedure. Now, with these two intuition in mind, uh, um, one natural question you may want to ask is what about other clustering algorithm, right? Um, we love k-means, but also things like hierarchical and graph-like clustering are also really popular and common practice in a lot of these data analysis, uh, data analysis adventures. It turns out that all we really need in this case to extend to other clustering algorithm is that this very general p-value we write out, which I've told you, is quite computationally expensive to compute without additional conditioning applies generally to any sort of clustering algorithm that you can come up with. Where it really specialized for k-means in this particular case for hierarchical clustering is that you really need to understand how the clustering algorithm works in detail in order to come up with computational tricks I talked about before that can really help you to speed up the computation of this p-values. And in a paper authored by Lucy, in this case, we know that there's also an efficient recipe for doing so for various different links or variants of hierarchical clustering. And in this particular case, for general clustering methods, you can also extend the cartoon I showed you for computing different values of S to arrive at an approximate p-value using something like Monte Carlo. And in this, uh, yes, Peter. Uh, talking about different clustering methods, um, there was a question on Zoom yeah. that I want to bring up, um, asking, could you comment on whether the original problem you were talking about also um, 
if Bayesian inference would have the same issue? Yeah, it's a great question. So it turns out that in this case, for Bayesian inference, if you don't account for the likelihood that you've selected for the data, it's going to run into the same problem. So essentially, for posterior, in order to make your Bayesian selective inference correct, you need to account for the fact that you are essentially computing the likelihood of selecting this hypothesis as well. Uh, but great question. Um, and, if, and with these intuition in mind, I've also talked to you a little bit about the single cell testing cases. And in applications, we often want to also test for a difference in means between also a single feature, not all the features overall. And it turns out that something like this, which is a very natural extension of the all genes testing cases we've talked about before, it's also going to work out. Uh, so the details are obviously going to be a little bit more involved because now I have a different set of test, test, test statistics. The, uh, the distribution we're going to arrive at are also going to be different. But the key insight is that Lucy and I essentially showed last year that the set of p-values can also be computed very efficiently for both k-means clustering and hierarchical clustering. Oh, the indicator for the features? Exactly. So like the question cluster. here is that uh, what's the null hypothesis over here? The j is just going to index the number of or the index of the features of so the genes in this case. So it's basically asking across these two like clusters we estimated whether there's a a difference in this um, like particular feature J. Yes. What is the relationship between the P ideal and this P selective? Yeah, it's a really good question. So the question is on what's this sort of like practical p-value we can compute versus like the ideal p-value we want to compute, but we could not for a computational constraints. Um, the short answer is that they both control the type one error rate in the sense that they're not going to give you more false discoveries when the, um, there's really no true clusters. In practice, we've, uh, we've observed that in the cases where we can actually compute both, the selected p-value we get with additional information is going to have a little bit less power empirically. So by conditioning on more information, you essentially are reducing the power of your testing procedure. Um, I'm excited to also then show you some examples of, like for instance, in simulation that would procedurally works out. I'm going to go through them a little bit faster just because you know we've written paper about it. Of course, it works in practice. But just to show you that it really works in the simulation cases, uh, in this case, I'm drawing the data again from this 100 observations that I had before, and I'm applying k clustering to get different clusters. And if you actually repeat and do our procedure, you're going to get that the p-values we have, which are the orange and the green line over here, they hug the diagonal really closely, which means that they're following uniform 0-1 distribution, which is a validation that in the cases where we know there's no true null hypothesis, in this case, they control the type 1 error rate. And if you move on to the power simulation, of course, in this particular cases, you're also going to get the example that in this case, we want our power to be large because we know that there are true clusters over here now. And uh, if you use our testing procedure, you're going to get that as the distance between the clusters increases in this case, the, prob the probability that we reject our null hypothesis with a given alpha threshold also increases over the larger distance. So essentially, these are just sanity checks to make sure that we not only have the power to reject the null hypothesis, we're also controlling our type one error rate. Um, to conclude my slide, I'm really excited to show you coming back to some of the problems that were asked in the first part of the talk as well, to think about how we actually can apply or how well these methods fare on the real data analysis. And I'm gonna apply our methods to these uh, single cell data collected by 10X genomics in trying to understand the profiling of human immune cells. And in the first set of the experiment, I'm going to show you an example of how we're able to control the empirical type 1 error rate on these single cell data analysis. And to do so, I'm going to construct a pretty negative control data set in the sense that I'm going to, only going to um, sample one type of cells, the memory T cells here, and apply k means clustering with k equals 5 in this case. And you can see that I have this giant 5 choose 2 table in understanding the difference between each pair. And because there's no, or because I've drawn all the cells from the same cell type, intuitively, there shouldn't be a lot of biological heterogeneity going on, especially this is already after processing to remove things like batch effects. And if you apply the naive p-value, probably not surprisingly, you're going to get the p-values are too small. 
which means that if I use this naive p-value to guide my biological conclusion, there are going to be five very distinct cell types using these statistical evidence. On the other hand, if you apply our selective p-value, you're going to get that these p-values are much more moderate. In particular, these are before any sorts of multiplicity correction for multiple testings or procedure that we're performing here. And if you really follow the p-values we get from our selective procedure, you're going to get that there is moderate to little statistical evidence that there is a lot of cell type heterogeneity. So in this particular case, again, just to remind us that because I've only sampled from one single cell type, I think our, our procedure agrees with the underlying biological truth a lot better. And moving on to the example next, you can imagine that I've shown you now that we're able to control the type 1 error rate on real data sets, but I also want my procedure to have power to really tell different cell types apart when there are truly different clusters in my data as well. So in this particular case, I've sampled five different cell types and k-means clustering give me five different clusters. Um, and in this case, the different clusters we get from k-means clustering roughly uncover the true cell types we have that I sampled in my data sets. And if apply both set of p-values, you're going to get that our selected p-value are also going to give you really small values, which means that if you follow either procedure here, when you do have a lot of cell type heterogeneity, we're still going to get the correct biological conclusion that there's a lot of evidence for different cell types. And I saw a question earlier in the audience. Yeah, so maybe reading too much into the numbers, but on the previous slide, it seemed that all the p-values from your p-selective uh, were less than a half. And so if they were uniformly distributed under the null, this would be like two to the minus uh, 10 or whatever. Uh, so is, is that just reading too much into the numbers or are they actually uniform here? I guess yeah, I it's a really good question. I think the key point is that um, the underlying biological truth is a little bit harder to assess, right? I think this was raised in the audience as well. So even though I've tried to control for things like by conditioning on one single cell type, there still could be other variation in my data that explains a p-value or a difference. I think the key point I want to take away is that in this particular case, um, our p-values are qualitatively much more aligned with our biological conclusion here, um, even though they might not be exactly distributed as uniform zero one with this pair of testing, but a great, um, a great question. Um, so coming down to this uh, five two cell types, we can see that using our like uh, procedure will also give you the correct biological conclusion that these two five clusters do truly correspond to five different cell types. Um, just to summarize the part of my talk, I've told you that in practice, especially in these more than single cell data analysis pipelines, we often do want to test the hypothesis that were generated after doing investigations or um, doing exploratory analysis on the data. And these questions do correspond to a lot of scientific interest. And I've proposed methods that are valid and efficient for testing for differencing means between estimated clusters after k-means clustering, and very briefly, also after hier um, hierarchical um, like clustering as well. And the key intuition of our, of our methods is that in order to arrive at a valid procedure, the real only thing you need to do is to condition on the aspect of the data that la let you to ask that first question in the very first place. With that, I want to thank you so much for your attention. As Yi Chin gave a great introduction to you in, in the previous talk, um, statistical science is kind of built around this expectation um, classically, that you um, you collect your data and then you fit um, models that were specified before you collected the data, and you test hypotheses that were collected before you you really collected your data. But of course, the modern reality is a lot more complicated than that, especially as um, we're collecting this like very complex, rich, um, high dimensional data. We're a lot more likely to do something like uh, first we collect our data and then we're going to explore it. We'll do things like, oh, we'll like fit like a bunch of different models. We'll evaluate each of these models. And then using that information, we'll then do things like pick out of like our candidate models, pick the one that we like the most that fit our, seem to fit our data the most. And then, and only then, are we going to test the hypotheses that really were suggested by this model. So a very different paradigm from the expectation. And this reality that I'm talking about, um, really this, 
um, leads to a lot of what I'm going to be calling double dipping. Um, you've already seen a little bit of this in, in Nietzsche's talk, but I'm expanding the definition a little bit. Um, I'm thinking about double dipping as uh, kind of like vaguely any time that we are improperly using the data for two tasks. So we saw uh, in, in our last talk, one example of this is using the same data for task one, generating a hypothesis, and task two, testing a hypothesis, same data, um, but also things like using the same data in order to one, fit a model, and also two, to evaluate it. So what are some approaches to um, address issues that arise from um, double dipping from like improperly using your data twice? Well, Yi Chen already went over um, some, a, a family of approaches that um, we have personally worked on. And the idea behind this is, okay, so we know that um, these like classical statistical procedures were, um, do not explicitly account for double dipping leading to problems. So one idea for addressing that is let's just develop different procedures. Let's, um, uh, let's like really specialize to this problem and let's just like think about like a different, like, you know, like for example, like a different statistical hypothesis test that is actually going to account for the fact that say like we selected a hypothesis using our data. Um, so I have on the slide here, um, like Yi Chin's um, paper on Kenyan clustering. Um, he also talked a little bit about um, my paper on um, hierarchical clustering. Um, there's also like, I've worked on other problems like, um, like um, selective inference for, for, for regression trees. And the thing that I really want to emphasize from the slide is that while these are nice in the sense that they are very, very specialized, you allow to, you think very carefully about a very specific procedure and you can exploit the problem structure really well. That's kind of like the big advantage, but really like it's very bespoke, right? It's tailored to the data analysis procedure. Every single one of these things, the reason why they're different papers is because the computational details are totally different because they all have to be very specialized to the specific data analysis procedure. Even changing like a different algorithm, like going from k-means or hierarchical clustering is resulting in a different statistical paper. So, you know, if you're thinking about it from the data analysis side, not from like the stats method development side, if you're thinking about doing some data analysis and you want to account for double dipping and you're thinking about this family approaches, unless someone um, like me has written a paper for you, like on the specific data analysis pipeline that you're using, you're kind of out of luck. I think that's kind of a bummer. <laughs> that kind of motivates a different family of, of approaches, which I think many of you in the audience are actually probably were familiar with before you even stepped into the room today. And this is like a very, this is like a radically different idea, a very radically different approach to the problem, right? Instead of developing some kind of like a new specialized statistical procedure that's going to account for double dipping and avoid these like statistical issues, Let's just avoid the problem altogether. Um, and this, this idea that you've probably been familiar with is called sample splitting. So if you start with a data set like the one I have um, on the screen here, um, this is like uh, four observations measured on two features. You can think of this as like four cells and two genes or something like that. And the idea behind sample splitting is instead of double dipping this data, um, you know, generating and testing hypothesis or fitting and evaluating a model, we're going to add an extra step into our pipeline where um, first we're going to split up our observations randomly into two sets. So um, this will give us a training set which contains, you know, two out of four of these observations in it and a test set that contains um, two out of four of these observations. Um, and the idea behind this is because these have kind of, kind of been, these are like an independent random partition of our data. Um, so if we do things like we use the training set to select a hypothesis and then use this independent held out data to test this generated hypothesis, we're not double dipping, right? We're not reusing any information in these two steps. So really there's nothing stopping us from using classical statistical methods. No, we have just avoided the double dipping problem entirely and um, everything's kind of fine and dandy. Similarly, if you wanted to um, do this process, um, you could fit some model 
that you're interested in on the training set, and you could could evaluate that model using the test. Set. And kind of the nice, the really nice idea about this is it's really like one size fits all, right? Because we're just avoiding the problem. We can take advantage of these like very well developed, out of the box, like classical solutions to model fitting, to model evaluation, um, to like hypothesis generation. Um, this really doesn't like put any put. This idea doesn't seem to put a lot of restrictions on the on the particular methods and ways that we are analyzing our data. It's very, very flexible. It's so flexible, in fact, that I think it's kind of thought of in, these, in the context of these double dipping problems as like a one size fits all approach. Like it's very much thought of as like this thing that just should just like work right out of the box. You can just apply it for any data analysis procedure that you can dream up. Is that really true though? All right, well, you've been here for, for an hour already. So if you're paying sharp attention in each and talk, you should already be sort of like questioning this claim, this idea that I'm putting into your head that like sample splitting is really one size fits all. And the reason is each and actually already saw it gave you an example of a particular problem setting um, where actually like sample splitting doesn't avoid double dipping and suffers from the same issues as like naively using all of the data twice. And this came up in the setting of using the same data to generate a, and test a hypothesis. Each and already went into like a lot of details of this problem, so I won't go into too much, um, but it just has like jog your memory a little bit. The idea behind this was you're going to take your, take, um, your data, you're going to cluster the observations. On the slide here, I have um, simulated data that really all comes from one cluster. So all of the observations really have the same mean, the same variance, the same everything actually. Um, and by clustering the observations, mimicking kind of like the uh, pipeline that you would do on real data when you didn't know like the truth that these actually come from one cluster, what you would do is you would wind up with this like red and blue cluster and that would could be thought of as generating the hypothesis that the mean of the second feature is the same between the red observations and the blue observations. Um, and what we saw is that if you use like naive methods, which are to use like a classical method like the t-test, without accounting for double dipping, you're going to um, you're going to reject the null hypothesis of prejudice, which suggests that um, these two clusters are different on the second dimension, even though really there isn't. That was kind of unsurprising. Like we know that this pipeline is wrong, but kind of the more, um, oh shoot, I... <laughs> it's been a while since I used the clicker. Um, okay. Um, getting back on the page that I was on. Um, we kind of know that this like naive pipeline is, is wrong, but kind of like the more surprising fact, I think in this example, is that sample splitting actually didn't work. And kind of the issue, um, if I can try and get the clicker back on here, I can't seem to get the clicker. Okay, so the thing I want to emphasize is that um, the, the idea behind like why this didn't work was that double dip, was that sample splitting didn't actually allow us to avoid double dipping. In this thing that I'm calling step 2.5, um, where you had to where you had to transfer the labels that you got in the training set to cluster labels in the test set, that act require you to use the data in the test set. So this thing that I'm calling step 2.5 and step three, that's actually double dipping the test set. So this is, a, this is one example in the context of generating and testing a hypothesis where sample splitting actually doesn't work. It in fact, completely fails to avoid the issue. And now I'm going to go through another example where sample splitting doesn't work. And this is in the context of a different problem. This is in the context of using the same data to fit and evaluate a model. Okay, so um, what I have on, on here are something like 100 observations on two features. And a question that I'm sure any of you that I've actually done clustering in practice has popped into your head is, okay, I want to cluster this data. How many clusters should I use? Like what, if, it, if I'm using k-means, k-means is gonna ask me for a number of clusters to fit, what should I actually use on this data? There's a lot of different methods for doing this, but like one um, very simple idea for answering this question is what you might do is you, for a lot of different values of K corresponding to different numbers of hypothetical clusters, 
what you might do is you would fit a model with like you know one cluster, two cluster, three clusters, four clusters, so on and so forth. And once you have those, those candidate models, you might then try and evaluate that model using a loss function, something like within cluster mean squared error. So um, if you were to carry out this process using all of the data to both do the model fitting to, to, to do the clustering, as well as to do this like model evaluation to compute this like within cluster sum of squares, then what you're gonna do is, what you're gonna get is something on this particular data set is this like uh, plot that I have on the right. And what you're seeing is that essentially the effects of double dipping. We have used the data twice and we have not accounted for it. So um, what, we're, what the, this curve seems to be suggesting is that the more clusters you have, the better um, this model is fitting our data when in truth, I simulated all of these observations from a, a, a single cluster. And this is another example, in fact, where sample splitting cannot be used. I'm just gonna go over like the idea of like how you would apply sample splitting to this new problem. So um, I'm starting with the same data that I had on the last slide. Uh, this is toy simulated data, um, all coming from one cluster. And then to apply the sample splitting idea to try and avoid double dipping, you would split the observations randomly into a training link test set, as I've shown on the slide here. What you might then do is you would cluster the training set. And then what you really want to do is you want to evaluate it on the test set. So you want to somehow um, compute within cluster mean squared error on the test set. But just kind of like visually, you can see there's a problem with this, right? Um, there are no colors in the test set. So what does it even mean? There are no cluster labels in the test set as well. So like, what does it even mean to compute within cluster mean squared error on the test set? And that's really like what caused us to have to um, add this kind of like half step where we um, assign labels to observations in the test set. And then what we see is that, well, okay, like in the last example, we have double dip the test sets. And what actually happens when you construct these curves is you can see that sample splitting does essentially the exact same thing as the naive method. And that's because it suffers from the same problem. Naive method double dips all the data, the sample splitting method double dips the test set, conceptually kind of the same thing. I ask a question here. Um, so the metric we're looking at is within cluster MSC, right? Yeah. But typically don't we also, I mean, if you cluster every data point by itself, mm -hmm. that's probably going to be the, uh, you're going to just keep getting smaller and smaller. Yes, yes. Right? So wouldn't we also care about something like intro cluster, entire cluster distances and stuff like that? I'm not entirely sure if this metric by itself is going to help us select a number of clusters that's uh, ideal for the data. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, we'll be in, if I'm to sum summarize the question a little bit. So you're, you're saying that like, okay, so this thing that I'm putting up, it, it, it seems kind of silly because I, we already know that like, if I put in like more clusters, if I put every observation in its own cluster and I then evaluate on the same data, like what's like the within, within cluster distance, it's, it, it's gonna be, it, it is going to be, be zero. And that is kind of like, that, that is actually in fact, like the effect of, the effect of double dipping. If we were able to, and um, we're going to see like an, actually an example of this in, in our method, if we were hypothetically able to get like an independent replicate of the data and then like looked at like how well that clustering performed, um, then we shouldn't see that like, you know, an infinite number of clusters is, 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 is the right fit. Um, so I think what you're suggesting, like looking at like between cluster distance or some other metrics, there are other, other ways that to um, choose the number of clusters that doesn't like suffer, that doesn't like um, completely break down due to, due to this double dipping issue. Um, but I'm just kind of trying to demonstrate this particular idea. Uh, uh, can we see double dipping as a form of uh, model overfitting, especially when you were talking about the model feed before and the other example, right? Yeah, that's a really great question. So the question is about double is about like over the idea of overfitting, um, and is this like the effect of overfitting? Yeah, I think that's a, that's another way to look at it. I'm kind of thinking of overfitting as like a subset of of, of double dipping. Like an overfitting is a, a, another 
um, like aspect of like you are using the data twice and then and thus getting like um, unrealistically optimistic ideas of of how well the, the model fits. All right, so um, hopefully now you're on the same page as me that sample splitting um, really isn't a one size fits all solution, even though we sometimes think that it is. Um, we've seen two particular examples all centering around clustering where sample splitting is not a good option, um, but that's actually not the only case where sample splitting isn't a good option. So to be a little bit more general, any setting where there's really like one parameter of interest per observation, sample splitting is going to inherently run into conceptual and like empirical problems um, due to the fact that you're splitting the observation up. Um, so like other examples where that might occur is be beyond clustering is like, you know, any kind of like, say like low rank matrix approximation. So think something like PCA or other matrix factorization algorithms, um, but also some, you know, any things like more nonlinear dimension reduction algorithms where like really you're trying to find like one latent variable coordinate per observation is also going to suffer from the same conceptual issues. Moving away from the unsupervised setting a little bit, um, this might also come up in things like, uh, very drastically different, but like demographic estimation, um, where like if you have data on the per province level, or, or like the per state level, and you really want like projections of like things like population or like mortality on a per province level, but your observations are on the per province level, um, that's another setting where like sample splitting doesn't seem to, to seem to make a lot of sense and really trying to hammer it in into like the 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 problem to work um, is going to lead to problems. Another example is like non IID data. So like sample splitting really relies on the idea that you have independent and identically distributed observations. So you can just like when you split them up randomly, you're going to get independent and identically distributed things. If that's not the case, like if your if your data is something like time series data that really has like this temporal correlation, then your if your observations represent say like different time points. Um, sample splitting isn't actually going to lead to independent training and test sets. Another example where sample splitting might not be the best fit for you is, well, if you have data that have outliers or influential points, like what I'm illustrating on, on the right, and here you can see there's kind of like a big outlier kind of very much on the right, then sample splitting will, if, if these observations were IID, were, were independent, then sample splitting will produce independent training and test sets but you still might not be very happy because in the end, this outlier can really only go into either the training set or the test set. So even though your training and test set might be independent, they're not really so comparable, which makes it a little bit more, more unattractive for these, um, the, for something like model fitting and evaluation. So our question was, okay, so there's all of these settings where we would really like to use something like sample splitting because it's so flexible in like what data analysis techniques we're actually really using, like what algorithms we're using, um, but sample splitting doesn't work. So our idea was like, okay, you know, sample splitting doesn't work here, but like this idea of splitting is really what led to such nice flexibility in, in being able to use classical algorithms. Can we just somehow try and find a different way to split up our data into independent training and test sets? Obviously, I wouldn't be here today if the answer wasn't yes. Um, so I'm going to first show you this, this first splitting strategy that we came up with. Um, and this, um, this we came up with in the, in the, concept, in the idea where we had um, data on, we had count value data. So like what I'm showing here is four observations on two count value um, features. And um, so the idea here is I am, this procedure that we came up with, it takes this like um, observed data set and it's using it, it creates two, um, two data sets of the same size. So to contrast this to sample splitting, um, we started with four observations on two features. The training and the test set that we're creating, you can see they still have four observations on two features. So the dimension of the data is preserved. 
So how, how have I actually carried this process out? Well, okay. So I, what I've done here is I've zoomed into a particular cell of the original data. Um, I'm calling this XIJ. And as you can see, it's gone to, into two different places. One place is in the training set and one is in the test set. Where did this come from? The way that I'm, that I'm getting this is I'm taking this um, value, um, eight in the original data, and I am flipping, essentially just like flipping a coin eight times and putting the number of heads that comes up in the training set and the number of tails that comes up in the, in the test set. What's being shown in the yellow boxes is just a much mathier version of, of what I said, where um, epsilon is like the probability of coming up heads on this coin. So this is a way to create, you know, like two data sets for my original one, but like, why should I expect this to be helpful in, 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 in any way? Well, the reason why this is helpful actually comes from this very well-known like probability textbook result. Um, if you've taken a probability class, you might uh, have, have seen it um, and seen it as like binomial thinning of, of Poisson processes. And this result is really what tells us like why this kind of splitting is really helpful to us. And basically what this result says, if the observations, if each cell in my original data matrix was independently drawn from a Poisson distribution, then first of all, the corresponding cell in the training set created by this process, it is also independently drawn from a Poisson distribution where all that's happened is I scaled like the mean of that Poisson um, by like this known scaling constant, the, prob the, the heads probability on my coin. Similar thing happens in the, in the, in the test set. Um, I, what, what happens there is that the entries in there are also independently Poisson. So um, the first consequence of, of, of this result is really like the idea here is the training set and the test set really have like the same distribution as the original data, just up to some known multi multiplicative scaling constant in the parameters. What's more, if the data originally or independently were drawn from a Poisson distribution, then the training set and the test set are actually independent. And because of that independence, I can go ahead and I can, you know, I can select the hypothesis um, using this like training set X1 using whatever method that you can possibly wildly dream of. And then I can just go ahead and test it on the, on, on, on the test set without double dipping. Similarly, you could, you know, like you could fit a model on the, on the training set and then you can evaluate it on the test set. For the different features, are the epsilons here independent of each other? Or do you need to keep it consistent? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. So the question is about this epsilon parameter that appears in the sampling process when we're creating these, these training and, 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 and test sets. Um, so this epsilon really is just like a tuning parameter for, for, for this process, you know, like the, perhaps the most natural idea is to just to use 0.5, but you could use something else. Um, in principle, you could probably like, you know, when you're splitting up like each cell of the original data matrix, you could use like a different like heads probability. I think that's, that's the idea that you're bringing up. In principle, you could, but um, that adds like a lot more like things uh, not a lot more like knobs to, to, to play with in your algorithm. So we haven't actually, we haven't actually done this in practice. Typically we, typically when we carry this out, we're just thinking of using the same value for all of it. And I think that has some um, nice implications for the theory as well. We might come to it in, in some of the later time. So we were discussing double dipping. Um... Like, what's the sampling process if it's not binomial? So the question was, um, when you're discussing double dipping, what's the sampling process um, if it's not binomial? I think this might be about generalization to data beyond Poisson. Or can you do- uh, no, I guess the no, question, not... the question is more like, because now you're saying binomial splitting of the data would solve the double dipping problem. But then what's the- sampling process that makes double dipping happen? Like what's the distribution you're used to, you're used to do the sample splitting that you were saying that it will still have the problem of double dipping? Oh, I think I understand the question. The question is, um, I, I think there's two ways to understand the question. The first is like what distribution, like what distribution am I imagining generating the data in this example? 
in this example, I am imagining that the data was drawn from a Poisson distribution, though later we're going to see generalizations to this. The second way, the second question that I think I'm hearing in, in that is like, where, where is double dipping occurring on this, on this slide? Um, so um, if you were to use all of the data or to do sample splitting um, to in the examples that we saw, the concrete examples that we saw earlier in clustering on all of the data, so like on X or to do sample splitting in order to do both like model fitting or model evaluation, that would lead to double dipping. Yeah, but, but the, the question is, is, the question is, so you're saying that the double dipping is the sampling process for sample splitting that results in double dipping is not a result of a binomial distribution. It's not a result of a binomial selection of the data. Like, but then how did you split the data in when you're doing sample splitting? So sample splitting um, is a different is a different splitting strategy. Um, so if we go back like a couple of slides, oh, I guess I don't have a, a specific slide for it, but like visually, you can think of the difference between like um, this like binomial splitting strategy and sample splitting as like sample splitting would, would like um, just say like take the first two rows of X and put it as X1 and take the second two rows of, of, of X and put it as X2. We actually have a couple more questions at this point. Um, so okay. I thought maybe I could bring them up. Yeah. Um, two of them are kind of related about um, preserving the associations between features. So are you assuming that the features are independent of each other or does this process uh, preserve or uh, respect the association between uh, features that you may see in single cell and ASIC, for example? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so in this particular example, I am, in order to get statistical independence between X1 and X2, um, you do need to assume that the features are independent. That's kind of like embedded in this assumption where like each cell of the, the, the original data matrix is independently is independently generated. Um, the overall process procedure that we're going to propose is conceptually general enough to cover um, like a broader range of distributions, like um, each observation coming from like um, a vector of correlated Poissons, um, or like each observation coming from a multivariate normal. But the details of carrying it out may be a little bit more complicated. All right, so um, going back to where I was. Okay, so I've shown you a particular way of splitting up um, the uh, splitting up a, a, a data set into two um, two parts that have the same dimension. Um, in the case of count data, um, that under this independent Poisson data generating process for the original data are actually independent, and I have claimed that this. And this all this conceptually solves the double dipping problem because of the of the independence. But like, what? How does this help us? Like, like it might kind of seem like all I've done is um, accomplish the same things that sample splitting does, but with an additional parametric assumption. Um, so you know, where where does this really help us? And I think really where this helps us is in those motivating examples, really where like sample splitting isn't a good option. So um, I want to illustrate that this alternative splitting procedure that we are calling thinning, uh, thinning actually really avoids this pitfall of sample splitting in these like motivating examples involving clustering. So um, let's to, to see this. Let's like think about um, how we would apply like thinning to this problem of like um, clustering our observations and testing for a difference between them. So I'm going to go back to my uh, to my data. And um, in order to apply thinning, the first thing I'm going to do is instead of splitting the observations up into a training and test set, I'm going to use this like sampling, this thinning process in order to thin the observations into a training and a test set. And the thing I want to emphasize is that every observation in the original data set, like the one that I boxed out in orange, it has a counterpart in both the training and the test set. Because we took the counts that correspond to that orange box and just like literally split up the count into the training and the test set, it has a counterpart in both of these sets. Sharp contrast to sample splitting. 
Similarly, if you look at a different observation, like this, this one box in orange, that the information in that observation has gone into both training and test set, so it has a counterpart. We can see it in the continual use of the, or with the, use of the colored boxes. Okay, so now let's think about um, clustering, doing this task of like clustering to generate a hypothesis that these clusters are, are, are different and then testing it. Okay, so um, we can go ahead and we can cluster the training set and that would get us these two clusters that I'm labeling in, in, in blue and red here. And then the nice thing about this is that, okay, um, previously in sample splitting, we would have had to add, to add this like very awkward half step where we propagate these clustering labels on the training set to the test set label somehow. And we inherently had to do that just because like the tra clustering the training set because it only had half the observations in it, um, that like only led to labels for the observations in the training set. This no longer happens here. The, each, each observation in the, in the training set has a counterpart in the test set. So in order to like propagate these labels to the test set, we don't actually have to have to touch the test data. We just have to use the fact that we just have to like find its counterpart in the, in, in the test set and just propagate the exact same label. And we can already see just like visually sharp contrasts between like um, the sample splitting case and, and which uh, the sample splitting case, which um, actually had to double dip the test set in order to like get these labels um, versus like the spinning process. We can see like, um, while like the two clusters look like they're kind of like separated on the training set, um, because we are now evaluating this on like independent data, um, we are seeing that these like two, uh, the blue and red labels are no longer like looking very separated in the test set. So when you go on and, um, you know, like test for a difference in means, for example, between these blue and red observations, in the test set, you can see they're a lot more close together, um, and you would get a and um, you would get a very large p-value, um, which much better reflects the fact that um, all of the observations were actually drawn from a single distribution here. Um, or when you evaluate the number of clusters on the test set, we no longer see this see this phenomenon that we had seen in like both the naive method and, and sample splitting, where like just adding more clusters just just always, no matter what, improves the fit. You can see instead that the the within cluster mean squared error is actually minimized at the correct number of clusters, which is one. So this is really like a case. This is like an example of a setting where like thinning really shines. Sure, we had to add a new parametric assumption that sample splitting didn't need, but also like sample splitting literally can't solve this problem. Um, so what do we care about that? Wouldn't this method uh, um, remove outliers that might be something we want to keep somehow? That's but a really good question. Okay, so the question is about what happens with outliers. And this is especially relevant because I had actually already previously said that like outliers are a case outliers in your data are a case where you might not be perfectly happy with sample splitting because you can only put like the outlier in the training or the test set which like hampers like the comparability of the training and the test set the whole point of like you know using a training and test set is like ideally they should be they should be comparable just independent so if there were outliers in this data set um then if because like each officer like each observation actually goes in, the, some of the information goes in the training set and some of the information actually goes into the test set. If there was an outlier, then it would actually appear in both training and test. So this doesn't like, this doesn't do any magic of like removing outliers from your data set. It's all based on the original data. There were outliers in your data, there were gonna be outliers in the data, but it's going to um, preserve the comparability of your training in the test set in a way that sample splitting doesn't because that, because like that outlier is still going to exist in both training and test. So now I just want to show you um, another, ex another example, um, but um, this time I have actually generated data from um, two different clusters. Um, and the way that the clustering is presenting is that is in the second feature. So um, the first feature is drawn all from the same mean, but the second feature is half of them are drawn from like a Poisson three distribution and half of them are, are drawn from Poisson 25. So the correct number of clusters in this example is in the simulated data is two. Okay, so now I'm going to illustrate what happens when you when when you thin this data. 
Um, so I've gone through, through this binomial sampling process in order to thin the data into a training and a test set. And again, I want to emphasize each observation really is going, it has a counterpart in both the training and the test set. And when you cluster the training set, you get this like um, blue and red set of observations, which by the way, um, I simulated this data. Um, these estimated cluster labels actually line up pretty well with the truth of two clusters. When I cluster the test data, um, I, the, the, when I propagate these um, cluster labels from the training set to the test set, um, just using the fact that the orange, the, the orange observation um, has a corresponding like row coordinate in the training in the test set, um, I see that the that um, I, I see the kind of like the same clustering structure. And then um, if I do test for a difference in means um, with respect to the second feature, or I, I'm going to get a very small p-value, which is great um, because there really is a, it is a difference between those observations on that feature. Um, and also, if I look at this problem of, of, of like choosing how many clusters to use, if I plot the within cluster MSC, we see um, something very different um, from what we what we see when we use either the naive method or sample splitting, where we get this like really nice like V or U-shaped curve that's actually minimized correctly at the, the, the number of true clusters. Okay. Um, so, okay. So that was all very well and good. Um, we've seen that like thinning actually succeeds in um, settings where sample splitting actually fails. Um, but all of this was assuming that our data was Poisson distributed. Um, that's maybe all well and good if your data is count valued and you are willing to use a Poisson assumption. But what if you actually think that your data is over dispersed as is often the case in, for example, um, single cell RNA sequencing? Um, or what if like you don't have count data at all? Like can we somehow generalize this process um, to different distributions. So when thinking about this, we were thinking about like, okay, well, what did, what did we really like about this Poisson thinning process? Uh, the key elements of it were that we were able to split a single observation into two parts so that they have the same distribution as the original data up to a parameter scaling, but also that they're independent. So like, we're really like the million dollar question is, can we actually achieve these same properties when X is not Poisson distributed? And the answer actually surprisingly lay in this like very, this, this paper, this old paper from my colleague, Harry Joe at UBC uh, in a completely different context on, on, a, on it, it, it was developed in the context of, like he developed some theory in the context of like um, how to extend, how to construct time series um, models um, with non-Gaussian observations. Um, and it turned out that the key to um, extending Poisson thinning to more general distributions actually really lay in, 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 this, in this paper. So, um, okay. So instead of thinking about like, how to extend these ideas of Poisson thinning to all possible distributions, um, we decided to focus um, based on the results of this paper um, on convolution closed distribution. So hopefully the reason why is gonna become clear in like a slide or two. So convolution closed is a really fancy complicated name for a really simple thing. Um, a convolution closed distribution is one where if you take two independent things, uh, independent random variables following that same distribution and add them up, you're going to remain in the same family. Um, you're gonna, the same family. Um, and um, lots of distributions that you know and love, unlike the Poisson distribution, the negative binomial distribution, um, the normal distribution are really convolution closed. If you add up two independent Poissons, you're going to end up with a Poisson random variable where its rate is the sum of the, the rates. And this property actually gives us the key idea of how to extend this idea of, of to how to accomplish this goal of, of, of data thing for literally any convolution closed distribution. So um, if we, okay, so um, let's start from the very beginning. Um, we observe, we're imagining that we're observing data that's drawn from some convolution closed distribution. By the definition of convolution closed distributions, 
um, that realization, little x, could have come from the sum of x prime and x double prime, where those were drawn from distributions in the same family with like with um, like smaller values of this parameter lambda. Okay, so um, these these two things are are independent. If so, like just like by the definition of like our goal of data thinning, if we had observed these component parts that could have um, that that could have given give rise to our observed observation, then we would have satisfied our goal of, the, of data thinning. But the problem is that we don't actually observe these two things. These, this, is, this is all hypothetical. Like I don't literally observe x prime and x double prime. So the question is, can we somehow work backwards to recover these component parts? And our key insight is if you look at the conditional distribution um, of, of these components of, of like one of the component parts, um, given our observation, then that actually gives us a way to, 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 to reverse this process, to reverse engineer the, the idea, the, to reverse engineer the process that could have given rise to our data uh, by summing independent, summing independent parts. So we're just gonna carry that out. We are going to um, sample using this conditional distribution and if you go through the theoretical results, then we, then we actually see that this is exactly a way to accomplish the goals of data thinning, to get to, to turn one observation into two independent ones with the, same, with the same distribution up to a scaling constant. I think um, I'm looking at the clock and realizing that I clearly have way too many slides. Um, so, but um, I think, I, I have already gotten through a lot of the, the ideas, so I think maybe this would be a good time to just transition to the, to the question phase.